Uh, that's the lumberjack version of Noel Pullen. You're getting the summer version. <laughs> Hopefully uh, next year or in the next few years we'll have uh, the ambassador up here speaking on a virtual haptic holographic tablet and wearing a t-shirt, of course, because it's a tech conference. All right. Let's see. I don't have the slides on the screen down here, so I'm going to be turning back to see what we're, what we're looking at. Okay, let's get started. This is Mike. He's my friend, and he's the software development manager in Vancouver, Canada, at Hootsuite. And early one morning this year, Mike was standing at his laptop at his desk. He's working on our web application, when all of a sudden, his hands started to shake, and he had that sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach, the kind you only get when you're standing on stage in front of 400 people or something truly paralyzing has happened. And he asked himself, did I just bring down production? <laughs> yes, he did. Now, Hootsuite sends 28 million messages a week. That's about 4 million messages a day, 166,000 messages an hour, and 42,000 messages every 15 minutes. Anyone who went to Hootsuite.com at that time got a 500 error for the next 15 minutes. Mike didn't just bring down production, he brought it down in the most spectacular way. So I'm sure many of you have been in his shoes, uh, or been standing next to someone in his shoes. And let me tell you, it's an uncomfortable feeling. But now what? Our site is down, what happens? This is the crux, this is the decisive event in this moment how do you respond? And how you and how your leaders and how your colleagues respond to this crisis says everything about your culture. I'm going to come back to Mike in a minute. Natsa. My name is Noel Pullen. Uh, and as the ambassador said, my title is Senior Director of Technology, which is really ironic because nothing I do has anything to do with technology. Everything I do <laughs> is with people, helping them work better together. You can find me at these addresses, and if you have questions, you can write me an email. I work at a company called Hootsuite. We're based in Vancouver, Canada. We have an office here in Bucharest, like he said, and it's staffed with some of my favorite people, software developers, product managers, designers, office managers, and customer support advocates. Hootsuite is uh, the most widely used platform for managing your social media. We help organizations turn their messages into meaningful relationships. We do this on a web app, we do this on a mobile app, and through educational products. We have 15 million users, 2,500 enterprise customers, we're in 175 countries, and we send, like I said, about 28 million social media messages a week. We were founded in 2008. We found that magic of product market fit soon after, and we grew from 70 people in 2012 to almost a thousand people this year. I started in 2011 and I witnessed this hyper growth firsthand and today I want to share with you some stories uh, that I learned along the way and some stories about our culture. So we're going to talk about culture, we're going to talk about why I care about it, how it's helped us and how it can help you. So what is culture? I'm sure that you've probably felt a culture Sometimes when you walk into an office building, you can feel what it's like to be there and, and you can glean the kind of environment or culture it has by the decor on the walls, the jokes that people tell, the level of noise in the office, the topics of conversation. But it's something I find hard to articulate, easy to feel, hard to articulate. Well, here's some definitions I pulled from a Harvard Business Review article about a conversation on LinkedIn. And these are all good definitions of culture, uh, and I like them. But over the months that I've been doing what I'm doing, I've come to a definition that I like even more. And it starts with this term called ma. Ma is a Japanese term for negative space. You can find negative space in the pause between notes in music, or the pause between words in a sentence. And Margaret Heffernan put it beautifully, it is the mortar between the bricks. Cu cultures like that is the space in between us. In fact, it's all the things that happen in the space between us. It's how things get done in the space between us, often with us not having to think about it. 
There's supposed to be some animations here, but that's okay. I'm going to talk to the slide as it is. How do you start? With, where does your culture come from? How do you start with it? Well, it starts with your beliefs, how you think about things. That informs the things that you value. The things that you value cause you to act in a certain way. And if you're acting in a certain way repeatedly, you have a repeated behavior pattern that you do consistently in an obvious manner, you end up with your culture. This is a picture that was on the bathroom in our washroom. So Hootsuite defines its culture as a passionate, egoless team having fun building something bigger than themselves. Now, why did we take the time to define our culture, put words to it, build a, a deck out of it that we made into a book that we give to new employees? Well, here's the reason. There should be a resume section for got an offer from big company, but didn't want to deal with that shitty culture. Control is an illusion. You can't control what your employees say about your company when you're not there. You have to trust that they're saying things about you that are positive. And, you know, word of mouth or places like Glassdoor now, they will act as accelerators or decelerators on your ability to grow your company. Here's another reason. The culture starts with the beliefs of the early founders. But as your organization grows, it becomes harder and harder for them to influence your culture. They need to rely on all the people that they're working with to evolve that culture in a positive and participatory way. They need to show, tell, and ask others who are working with them to evolve that culture. So I'm going to tell you a story. This is a slide of the people in our Hootsuite product development team over time. And I want to take you back to March of 2013. Uh, that's between the yellow stage and the green stage there. And at this time, our CEO came to us and said, look, uh, it's time to double the size of the product development team, and you've got to do it as fast as possible. So we're like, ooh, okay. How do we go from around 50 people to more than 100 as, as fast as possible? So we sat down and we thought, right. Uh, how are we going to compete with the financial might of Amazon or the technical cachet of Facebook? Not to mention the hundreds of other attractive startups that are in our local backyard. I mean, everybody competes on compensation and technical challenge and perks to a degree, and so do we. But what makes us different? How can we stand out from that crowd? we realized it was our culture. That was the main reason why people loved working at Hootsuite, was the other people. They truly felt like a, a belonging to a team that was passionate and egoist and having fun building something bigger than themselves. So we set out to use that as our, as our differentiator. And we did this by putting effort in. I'm not talking about creating a marketing campaign, spending some money, and, and running advertisements. I'm talking about getting involved in our community to show people the things that we did, the way that we worked, the experiments we ran, the things that worked well, the things that didn't work, our opinions about the future of technology, how we did things. And we did this by going to meetups. We did this by inviting other companies to do knowledge exchanges with us. We went to universities. We invited speakers in, in an effort to show people what we did, and to help them. We even ran a class on, on Scala. We were struggling with our, our adoption of Scala and to find Scala engineers, so we, we created a class that we could teach to the community. And we discovered that the term for this is called working out loud. It's essentially narrating what you're doing and sharing the results of those experiments or your thoughts with the wider world. And it feels really good. And you can do this actually as much inside your company as you do outside. So what does the data say? We went from hiring one person per month in the yellow phase to hiring one person per week over the course of the year in the, in the scale phase, in the green phase, where we were growing quite quickly. And that thick black line at the bottom of the picture, that's our voluntary turnover over the same time. It went up by less than 1%, from 0.4% to 1.2%. So what does that all mean? 
It means we were able to attract and keep good people longer. We had found our cultural competitive advantage. So let's talk about you. Let's talk about how you turn your culture into a competitive advantage. So first is one question you need to ask. My friend Marius told me this question. It's wonderful. We'll get to it in a sec. And then depending on how you answer that question, uh, you'll get five ways that you can start uh, turning your culture into a competitive advantage. The question is, do you believe you can change a culture? Do you believe you can change your organization's culture? If the answer is no, well, okay, hopefully stick around, maybe I can change your mind. And if you believe it's yes, then great, start evaluating the level of enthusiasm and capability for the people you work with to change the way they do things in the space between them, to change the way they work together. Next, five ways to start building your cultural competitive advantage. First, trust by default. Trust is in this list of um, things that people look for in an amazing work environment. Trust is at the root. Trust enables everything else on this list. And where you sit on that spectrum of trust and control will dictate your culture because everything ties back to trust. So whether you sit on the spectrum of believing that people are inherently untrustworthy and need external mechanisms of punishment and reward to motivate them to do great work, or whether you sit on the spectrum of trustworthiness and believe that by default people are trustworthy and you extend trust to them and you believe that in return they will, they will extend trust to you and do that the best that they can with the information they have in order uh, to grow your company, well, well, wonderful. It doesn't matter which end of the spectrum you sit on. Neither is right nor wrong. What I'm saying is that if you sit closer to the end of the spectrum, where you trust by default, you're that much closer to building a cultural competitive advantage. I like what my friend and former colleague McKenzie said about trust. He said that trust is the confidence you have in the decisions and abilities of your team, knowing they think the same of you. Without trust, we can never push our boundaries, gain new experiences and hone our expertise. It's a difficult trait to quantify, but when you have the trust of your team, you can grow further in your skills and your career. Trust your people to recruit, to hire, to push to production, to onboard, to provision servers, to talk to your customers, to change the direction of the product, to experiment with organizational design, to develop new strategies for your business. Trust them to do the right thing with the information they have. Trust that they are working in the best interest of your organization. Speaking of pushing to production, uh, oh, before we get there, let's talk about do and say. So Matt, Matt brought up an interesting point. Uh, Netflix in 2001 released this seminal document. It was their culture deck, and in it, they talked about um, all the things that made them special, what was, what was unique about Netflix's culture. And on slide four, uh, they have ha, four words, Inter integrity, communication, respect, and excellence. And these sound really good on paper. In fact, they'd sound really good on a poster in your lobby. But then you flip to slide five and you realize these were the words on a poster in the lobby at Enron a company that went bankrupt from fraud and whose leaders went to jail. And their whole point is that values are not what you say they are. They are how you act. Where you sit on the spectrum of trust will, will show up in the things that you do, not the things that you say. You can talk all you want about your culture, but it doesn't matter. Values are not what you say they are, they are how you act. These are Hootsuite's values that came out in 2014, six years after the founding of the company. They're not aspirational. They're a reflection of the way we'd been behaving for the last six years. And they show up in the way that we hire, the way that we recruit, the way that we onboard, the way that we push to production, the way that we provision service, the way we talk to our customers, the way we uh, modify our product, the way we design experiments to change our organizational structure, the way we fi figure out our strategy. They show up everywhere. And Speaking of pushing to production, let's get back to Mike. So we left that story. There's Mike. 
standing at his laptop with that sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. So what does he do? He immediately gets on the chat channel for outages, and he asks for help. And everyone on that channel rallies to him and helps him solve this problem. And our ops manager suggests a way that he might resolve the 500 error quite quickly. Within 15 minutes, it's up and running again. Now what? Now what is that Mike gets together with all the people who helped him out and have subject matter expertise in this area, and he runs a blameless post-mortem. We call it a five whys. It's a way of looking at or looking for the most probable cause of this problem. And, and how can we fix the system so that this doesn't happen again? Notice, I'm not talking about how do we fix Mike. Mike doesn't need fixing. Mike didn't do this maliciously. Mike's doing the best he can with the information he has. He's, he did this by accident. So I want us to figure out how can we bulletproof the system so nobody has to go through the same thing that Mike just went through. And after we finish this exercise, we take a picture of the whiteboard and notes, and we publish it on our internal network to the whole company, and we commit to fixing things. Etsy takes this a step further. Every year, they award a three-armed sweater to the person who breaks their production site in the most spectacular and surprising way. And the CTO said, the reason we do this is because we want to look at accidents as data. We don't want them to be a moment of embarrassment that people shy away from. They also publish their, their learnings to the greater company. They call it a public service announcement. And it's a wonderful exercise because they want other people to learn from these accidents, not to be embarrassed about them. Some cultural elements from that story. Trust. We trust our software developers to push to production. And if there's a problem, we trust them to fix it. There's no other team that does this. It's their responsibility, and we trust them. Helpfulness. Helpfulness is a secret weapon. Both Sean Aker and Margaret Heffernan have cited helpfulness as the, one of the key differentiators in highly successful teams. Margaret Heffernan, in her TED Talk, talked about an experiment that was run at MIT where they collected some volunteers and they broke them up into groups and they gave them very hard problems to solve. And can you guess which groups were the most successful? It's not the smartest groups. It's not those groups with the highest aggregate IQ. It is the groups that were most helpful and most diverse. These groups had the most empathy for one another. They gave each person an opportunity to speak. There was no one dominant voice, and they had the most women. Lastly, psychological safety. This was uh, brought out recently by Google as the key reason, as a difference between their mediocre performing teams and their highly performing teams. Psychological safety is this idea that you can raise your hand and say, I don't understand, or uh, I just brought down production without feeling embarrassed or fear of punishment or ridicule or insecurity. And it's only, as my colleague and friend Jordy says, it's only when people feel psychologically safe in their teams can they bring their best selves to work, and they can do their best work. Next is working out loud. So you, you do these things, you run these experiments, you have these events. How do you, what do you do next? How do you show people your culture? Well, you, you have to work out loud, narrating your story and sharing it with others. And I can tell you that when you do this, you unexpectedly help other people, and you get help unexpectedly. You can start, where do you, where do you get this material? You can start with tapping the power of your people. Look to the ideas and subject matter expertise of the people that you work with, because their passion and depth of knowledge about what they do and what they love will surprise you, and it will be the next source of your idea. I, I bet that you already do this. I bet many of you take part in hackathons. I bet many of you run unconferences or reading, reading groups or guilds. This is, this is a fantastic way to source new experiments. And then when you've got those ideas, let people play with them. Let them experiment. Do more than say, try things, see what happens, reflect on it, and then try again. And lastly, give away that expertise. You all have something unique about what you do. Share it with others. We at Hootsuite are so grateful for companies like Etsy, Spotify, Shopify, Intercom, Facebook, because they've open sourced a lot of tools that we use, and they've also told us about the way that they do things. 
Like, I would like us to reciprocate to our community. They've unexpectedly helped us. I would like us to unexpectedly help others. Because what's the first thing you do when you have a problem you need to solve? You likely type it into Google and look for an answer. Well, that's what we've done on a number of occasions, and we've come across articles that have helped shape the way that we do things. So I want us to reciprocate. And I would like you to reciprocate, too. But you just don't have to give away your own expertise. We give away the expertise of others, too. When we bring trainers in to teach us about how to write Go or how to write better Scala or how to, how to run experiments, I always ask them, can you give, can you give a meetup to the rest of our, like, to the Vancouver community uh, and, and share the same expertise with others? And I've done this half a dozen times, and no one has said no. They've all said yes, and these meetups have all been successful. People over data. So I was listening to a podcast uh, on NPR, National Public Radio in the States, run by a fellow named Guy Raz, and he interviews startup founders and, and their experiences. And he was talking to both uh, Joe Gebbia, the founder of Airbnb and the founder of uh, Instagram. And at various points in those two, the history of those two startups, they had reached a plateau. In the case of Airbnb, they had reached a plateau of a few hundred users they're in San Francisco, their customers are in New York, and they're looking at this dashboard every day and they're trying to figure out why they've, they've come across this plateau. And they take this question to one of their advisors at Y Combinator and he says, well, what the hell are you doing in San Francisco? Get on a plane and go to New York and talk to them. Figure out what they love about Airbnb. So that's what they did. And those early conversations focusing on the customer's experience or the people's experience with Airbnb is what later led to some their hypergrowth, changes in their product and the way they approach people. We take that to heart when we onboard new people. People and their experiences at the heart of this. So there are, there are two principles to the way that we onboard new people. The first is people want to connect with other people. I learned that from Oren Ellenbogen. People want to connect with other people. Not to-do lists, not manuals, not videos. So every new hire that comes in, we sit them down and we give them talks about every aspect of our company, how we make money, our culture, and all the aspects they need about our practices and technological solutions. And we do this in person for a reason. I want every one of those people to develop a relationship with that speaker. So if they have any questions about the things that they've learned, they know who to go to. They know who to talk to about that problem. And it's also the way that we instill our culture in, all the, in every new hire that comes in. So on the Tuesday after a new hire starts, I give a talk on our culture and, and why it's important. And this may sound funny, but I don't care if anyone remembers anything from that talk. All I care about is that they listen to the stories I tell about the way that people have, at Hootsuite have acted and I want them to leave with a feeling. I want them to leave that room feeling inspired to act in the same way. The second principle is that every software developer that starts pushes to production on day one. Now, we could invite people in and ask them to watch a video or read a document about the way that we, our deployment pipeline works, but that's really, that's only passive knowledge and it would violate the first rule that people want to connect with other people. So, we pair them up with a training guide and we have them push to production. And it's simply changing a humans.txt file, but it says so much more. It gives them an understanding of how we work. It shows them that the speed at which we operate, multiple pushes to production a day, it tells them that they are responsible for pushing to production. And if things go wrong, they are responsible to fix it. And we trust them to do this. And one of the benefits is it feels really good to do this because at the end of the day, you can go home to your partner and you look, look up humans.txt online and show them your name there and say, this is what I did today. And this, this practice of doing something culturally significant has moved on from the software development world in our company and it's being adopted as a way to onboard the rest of the new people in other departments at Hootsuite. One more thing. Does anyone remember this game show? It's called uh, Iron Chef. It was a Japanese game show where all the contestants were chefs. And they were given a set of ingredients, all the same ingredients. And they had a limited amount of time. And what they were asked to do was to create a dish out of these ingredients in that limited amount of time. And what's, what was wonderful about it was that you had all these chefs competing and they would 
despite having the same ingredients, they would all cre always create something different, something unique. Well, you're in the same boat. You're all trying to make a company, and you have a limited amount of time, and you have all the same cultural ingredients. But what you create from that will be a reflection of your uniqueness, of the special things about your culture. So the last lesson is don't copy. You can't duplicate somebody else's culture. Just be yourself. Because when you have something that no one can copy, then you have a competitive advantage. So if you find yourself here and you want to get there, or if you're there and you're falling to here, whatever the situation, you need to think beyond a six-figure salary, a technical challenge, and a foosball table if you want to attract and keep people for much longer. You need to think about doing things that attract and keep people. You need to create your own cultural gravity. You need to do things like you need to trust by default. You need to do more than you say, and you need to do this through an experimental way. And then once you've done those things, you need to tell people about them. You need to share and show the way that you're working. And then focus on people's experiences over, over data. In, in those onboarding sessions, I, the only thing I care about is, did people push to production? And are the speakers double-checking that the audience is receiving the message they're putting forward? Lastly, don't copy. When you have something unique, like your culture, you have a competitive advantage. Mulțumesc.